I came home after my second year, and my parents basically threatened me to get a summer job or year or else. And uh, so, um, coincidentally, that first weekend of summer break in May, my roommate, who was also a chemistry student, uh, he wanted to come down and take the tour. And he said, "I'm, you know, I'd like to see how they make whiskey." And I was like, sure, no problem. So we're walking through here, and of course, I know the tour guide. You know, growing up here, you know pretty much everybody. And um, I just kind of had this thought: Wow, that would be a perfect summer job. Right, you just get paid to talk. That's all you got to do. Stand around and talk all day. No offense, tour guides. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a little more difficult than that. Um, but it is a great summer job. And so that's when I started to learn about how much science goes into it and kind of the chemistry side. And I started to think, well, hey, maybe maybe I could be good at that. And two years later, I just got lucky because there's an opening with the company in, in Louisville at Brown Foreman. And so I, I moved up there in 2003, started working as you know a lab technician, basically entry-level chemist. Um, doing kind of all the analytical work on distillery support functions, you know, all the new make whiskey coming out of all the distilleries in Brown Foreman every day, um, our byproducts, our grain samples, all these different things. Um, did that for a year or two and then you know, kind of moved into the micro lab and pretended to be a microbiologist for a couple of years. The yeast lab basically, um, you know, the, the Louisville lab didn't support, you know, Lynchburg as much as we have our own microbiologists on staff here and have for years, um, but was doing all the kind of yeast work and everything for the, the uh, Kentucky distillers there um, within the company. And then uh, was, you know, basically managing a, a team of people that were doing, you know, more distillery quality work for a time. Um, and then in about 2011, I left the company and went to another um, distillery in, in Kentucky as their lead chemist. Spent about three years there, and then a great, had a great time there, and, and kind of working in some other distilleries, and had the opportunity to move back here to work for Jeff Arnett, um, and started January 2014 here um, as the assistant master distiller, and I've been in this role now about two and a half years, be three years in October. So, um, really cool thing to be in this role. Um, you know, I've worked, you know, probably about half the distilleries in Kentucky, and some or the major distilleries, right? Um, and, and been inside pretty much all but one in some capacity or another. Um, I've got a lot of great friends up there. And, you know, that's, that's kind of like, I like to just kind of start there with just the process and how we make it. Um, and um, certainly not here to talk about anybody else. And, you know, I've got a lot of respect for, for everybody and what they do. Um, what I like to talk about is what we do and why we do what we do. Um, so the big thing for, for me is transparency. I want you to know exactly how we make our whiskey. Um, there is no such thing as anything proprietary at Jack Daniels. It does not exist. Um, you know, now of course we don't we don't share our yeast with anybody else. Um, but I'm going to tell you exactly how we prepare our yeast and get it into our distillery every single week, right? And I'll tell you exactly how we make our barrels, right? So I love yeast rolls. Uh, yeah, yeast rolls. Um, I think we use yeast for infection? a little better application than rolls. But <laughs> Wait a minute. We can, Mary we can agree yeah, disagree. Do y'all use the same yeast at Miss Mary Bobo's? For we the do not. Rolls? I hate to ruin it for you, but we do not. Do oh, you want that over there? Yeah, it is. Sorry. Here, my, uh, my, oh, no, AD, you're my ADD will kick you. Oh, there you go. Have the, there you go. Uh, so, um, Let's talk a little bit about process then. And I, I know you just went on a great tour with Brandy, so I'm not going to recreate a whole hour plus tour, right? But there are a few things that I do like to hit on. Um, you know, first of all, the grain bills. Of course, we're picking rye today, so that's the 70% rye grain bill, 12% malted barley, 18% corn. Our Tennessee whiskey or our bourbon recipe is 80% corn, 12% malted barley, 8% rye. And then we do a 100% malt, 100% malted barley recipe that we're calling our single malt. Um, so minimum 12% malted barley in any grain bill that we do. Um, that has been tried and true for decades and decades. Um, that is, you know, obviously a very traditional type of grain bill. You have to have malted grain in the mix traditionally. Now in modern days, you don't necessarily have to have so much malt. Um, the important thing there, and what we need out of the malt is the enzyme capacity in the malt, which is basically what happens is when you're grinding, mashing, cooking grains, mostly corn or rye, grains store their carbohydrate as their, their food basically as starch. Starch that's hundreds, if not thousands, of sugars all stuck together, right? Um, the problem is you cannot make alcohol out of starch. It does not work, period. Um, you have to break that down. Every alcoholic beverage out there, whiskey, wine, beer, whatever, it is made 
with yeast fermenting sugar, right? Small sugars, not large sugar. Starch is a very large sugar. And you have to break it down into its components, which are smaller forms of sugar, fermentable sugars, that the yeast can consume. Yeast is completely blind to starch. So basically, you can take this grain, grind it, cook it, make a mash, and you can, I mean, you could cook it in water for a year at, you know, pressure and over 200 degrees, you're gonna have a big tank of grits. You're not gonna make any whiskey out of it, right? Because you just, you're just gelatinizing that starch and it will never dissolve. It'll never, it'll never be soluble in water in its form of starch. So that's where these enzymes come in. And so barley, you know, basically the, the seed is barley. It's most of ours is grown in Montana or Idaho and Colorado. They'll, they'll bring it into a malt house. We have companies that do this for us to our specifications, and they will basically germinate those seeds. Right? So what happens is they put in a large tank of warm water. Every little kernel of barley thinks, hey, got plenty of water. It's nice and warm. It thinks it's out in the middle of a field somewhere ready to grow, right? So it starts to sprout. Well, naturally, Mother Nature, in every little seed, it knows it has to use its proteins and rearrange them into these enzymes. And enzymes is just a fancy word for, think of it like a pair of scissors but these scissors only cut one thing, starch, very specifically. They clip very specific bonds that break down those starches that are hundreds of sugars into smaller and smaller forms of sugar, right? So naturally the barley has to do that because remember it thinks it's buried in a ground somewhere getting ready to grow. Well, until it can sprout and emerge from the ground and absorb the sunlight with its leaves, photosynthesis, right? Then it can create energy right carbohydrate from that process when it's buried underground that ain't happening right it doesn't get exposed to any sunlight so this is a natural process so when we get the malted barley shipped in from montana or wherever it's coming from we grind it and we add it to our tank of grits all that starch guess what it starts clipping off those sugars and breaking it down um, now it's very important to me because that's the way my granddad made whiskey. He started here in 1957. Um, you know, there was no natural chemical supply that you could just call up or, or whoever. I'm just, I just completely made that up. There may not even be a natural. And there, I think there is a natural. <laughs> there is. Anyway, um, <laughs> bottom line, you can, you can source these enzymes now that have been harvested and modified to very rapidly break down starch, right? Very, very quickly. So instead of scissors, think of it like a shotgun blast, right? You're just pulverizing that starch into the very smallest, simplest form of sugar there possibly is. Hmm. That will really increase fermentation time, right? It goes a lot faster and shorter. Um, it, will actually, it will absolutely save money because you don't have to have farmers growing malted mm -hmm. barley, or at least not as much. You wouldn't need 12%. You could probably get away with seven or 8%, right? Or less, you wouldn't need any, right? If you just relied, it on, relied on the additional enzyme. But when you, feed it the most simple form of sugar, which is glucose, right? It's gonna rapidly speed up fermentation. The yeast is not gonna have as much time, literally in that fermenter necessarily. Um, I absolutely believe then that will negatively impact the amount of flavor then the yeast can create. Um, and our whiskey is very, very sweet forward, very fruity, very estery, all functions of our yeast and the fermentation. Um, so I absolutely believe it is critical for what we do to use only the natural malted barley enzyme because the malt enzyme will break down the sugar into a double sugar form called maltose. So we know, we can prove that chemically, we can measure it in the lab, that we are feeding our yeast a different form of sugar, a more complex sugar, two glucoses bonded together as maltose. That is what drives our fermentation. Glucose is almost immeasurable during our fermentation. Mm. Um, and the yeast would prefer that, right? That's the smallest single sugar, it's easy, right? It's gonna be lazy, it's gonna eat that easiest food source it can first, right? Um, but we don't, we choose not to, um, even though that would save a lot of time and a lot of money if we chose. Um, so that's the first thing that is really different for us is the malt and then the yeast um, obviously is going to ferment this mash. Now we actually create a whole separate mash stream called yeast mash to just grow it from the lab scale to what we need for a fermenter. One fermenter here is 40,000 gallons. We need 1,700 gallons of yeast. I told you we have our own microbiologist. Obviously she cannot carry 1,700 <laughs> gallons of yeast into the distillery for each fermentation. So we take, just like what would they have done years ago, they'd take grain, they'd take water, they'd cook it up, sterilize it, right? A little bit of yeast food, they put their yeast in it, cap it, and they'd put it over in a creek. 
right? Keep it cold, let it pressurize, right? And then as they need to go back to it, they would go back to it and then, you know, repropagate and make new food as they went along. We don't keep it in the creek anymore. We have a lab, but Janessa is doing this. She's growing from the mother culture that comes from our old jug that we can date back to Prohibition time, the same use since 1938. Um, she's growing that, growing that up. Every couple of days, she'll go in and transfer it into fresh yeast food. It looks kind of like a dark beer. Um, it's very similar. It's not a dark beer, but very close to it. It's got food. It's the right pH that we want to condition it for the distillery, right? It's all about making baby yeast, and she'll grow it literally up to bigger and bigger jugs until every week she'll bring these nine liter jugs in and inoculate it into a yeast mash. Completely separate mash stream from the whiskey mash. Yeast mash is only malt and rye, just the small grains, right? Corn is great for starch and making alcohol. In yeast mash, we don't care about making alcohol. We want to make baby yeast. So more protein heavy, right, from the small grains. So we grind the malt, we grind the rye, we cook it in our cave water, right? So now we've made this perfect yeast food, right, to put the yeast in. The one thing, though, we also sour our mashes here, right? Now, the regular whiskey mash gets set back. We're back set. We use typically around 30%. Right? We, as much as we can recycle, we will. That's less water we have to pull out of the cave. Um, it provides you know, nutrients for the next fermentation. Right? It helps with consistency. But with yeast mash, let's stop and think about it. Yeast has to be done days in advance of fermentation. Because right? you've got to let that yeast make more baby yeast. This takes hours. So if we're still making yeast here and making baby yeast, that means we haven't fermented anything yet. If we haven't fermented anything yet, we haven't distilled anything yet. If we haven't distilled anything, there is no setback. Because that setback or back set is coming off the bottom of the still. Right? That's been mashed. It's fully fermented, fully distilled. There's no alcohol left. There's no active yeast. It's all dead. Because it's gone through that 200 degree column. Right? So how do you sour a yeast mash then? Well, back in the day, in my granddad's time, they would take a five gallon bucket, they would scoop some of it out, they'd put it over in the corner, let it sit. <laughs> Come back five, six days later, that gnarly, nasty, funky five-gallon bucket. They'd make the yeast mash, they'd pitch it in there, and it would start to naturally sour, right? Over the years, our microbiologist years ago started sampling that five-gallon bucket, and we have purified our own lactobacillus bacteria from that bucket and that old back set kind of back culturing process that we did. And now we are not only growing and propagating our own yeast, we're propagating and growing our own lactobacillus bacteria strain. Um, if you ever eat yogurt, buttermilk, those live acti mm -hmm. active cultures, that's lactobacillus. Lactobacillus will consume the natural sugars from the grains, just like we were talking about, and it doesn't make alcohol, it makes lactic acid. So that creation of lactic acid will naturally drop the pH or sour the mix and create that little bit of an acidic environment that the yeast doesn't love, but they do tolerate, right? They do tolerate it much better than any other potential contamination that could be coming in. Um, we have to worry about that because we're using only the malted barley grain for the conversion of starch to fermentable sugar, which means we have to add it to the mash below 150 degrees. Remember, enzymes are proteins. Proteins in heat denature, and they would become inactive. So we know a little bit of that barley field is going into our mash, right, at 150 degrees or cooler. We're not sterilizing it. So this acidic environment is an advantage for our yeast. They don't love it. Kind of like if you ever go to Kentucky Derby and it rains, and it usually does. Pours. <laughs> Lived in Kentucky 11 years. When that happens and you've got a muddy track, you don't just go bet on the fastest horse in the field. You bet on the horse that's the fastest in the mud, mm -hmm. right? That's kind of what we're doing here, right? We're setting that yeast up. It will tolerate the acid. Most bacteria will not tolerate any acidity at all. And so that's what it does. That is the real role of sour Stop. mash, right? <laughs> I, I figured you Not just lying. making this up. I'm I figured you wasn't lying. <laughs> well, maybe I am. Chris, so how do you make whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. This, is, this is important stuff. Yeah. I, want, I want you guys to know. Um, you don't have to remember it at all, but I just... Oh, I'm going to. I want to be as transparent as possible with oh, no, you guys. Awesome. You guys are getting ready to buy a whole daggum barrel. I want you to know exactly what went into it, right? Um, and I just I just don't believe in any secrets. I, look, uh, bottom line, I believe the more you know about how we make our whiskey, the more you'll at least appreciate it, right? Mm -hmm. Jack Daniels might not be everybody's favorite whiskey. I get it, right? No big deal. 
Um, but I want you to know what our people do here um, because we have a person doing that. We have a microbiologist growing our yeast, growing that lactobacillus. We're not, oh, it's proprietary, and there's some big, you know, folder of, or, you know, online, they're just clicking a mouse that, oh, yeah, this one says, oh, this aroma, that flavor, yeah, yep, yep. code is uh, uh, 304B52. Yep, that's ours. Click. And then they're literally, their quality control is the UPS packing slip that says, yeah, 304B52, that's it. And they just rip open a box and throw it in. Literally, the yeast makes the whiskey. It literally makes all whiskey. And it makes, in my opinion, it's the number two most impactful ingredient on flavor, only behind the barrel. So literally, the number two source of flavor and the very thing that makes your product, I think you want to control that in-house, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's pretty much common sense. Um, so again, proprietary yeast, yeah, we don't share it with any other distillery or anybody else, but that's what we do here with our yeast drink, right? Um, and the next time you guys come, we'll take it to the lab, meet Janessa, you can take a little drink of it if you want, the yeast, it's fine. Sign me yeah. up. Yeah, but yeah. I'm I'm for it. I'll take it. Clean you up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So after, after the fermentation, we get to about 12% alcohol. Um, you guys probably saw some of the work we're doing on our stills right now, one and four both. Um, all 100% copper stills. You know, that's the next thing for us. Um, copper will, it doesn't actually react, but it, catalyze rea it catalyzes reactions that we want to happen, help strip away sulfur notes that come in with the grains. Um, that copper will erode. Um, I don't know if you saw the big trays mm -hmm. that should have been still sitting out there, I think they're going back in. Um, so those trays, they have a bunch of little holes. They have the downspout on one side, the downcomer, and then the little holes. Those holes start at 5 eighths of an inch diameter. And then as it erodes, those holes get bigger and bigger. Um, and so that, you know, we have to kind of tweak and modify the pressure and the flow rates of each still as that happens over time. So we have to retray, you know, every six, eight years or so, and then the whole column has to be replaced about every 12 to maybe 18 years or something like that. A couple million dollars per still, all right? So that copper, because it is reactive and it is stripping these things away, we have to continually invest. Um, you know, stainless steel is an option. You can replace it with stainless steel. That would last forever, basically. It the same. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't taste the same. You're exactly right. You wouldn't get that same effect. Um, you wouldn't strip away those sulfur notes and things, but you can add copper back. Again, you can buy chemicals that can do this. Copper sulfate is used very commonly, you know, which is a powdered or liquid form of copper um, that gets pumped into the still to get that reaction. Um, is with, that considered an additive? Uh, as in regards of what? Of just like... Of bourbon laws? They're not putting it in the whiskey. I know, but they're okay. distilling it. I don't know. The copper, the copper would not distill into the whiskey, right? Unless it got physically blown over, which can happen. Um, but copper sulfate, you know, the boiling point is, is far, far, far too high to distill, to vaporize and distill and come over, right? It would flush out to the bottom. So it's not an additive into the product. It would be a processing aid. Um, but not something that we do here because you saw it, all copper right there. We have all that copper in our system. We have to invest and replace that, um, but we do not have to worry about how much of this we're pumping into our system, right? So it's just something that we believe in here too. Obviously, my granddad used copper stills when Jack was around back in the day. Copper would have been used because there was no such thing as stainless steel. Um, so just a very obviously traditional process there. Also the doublers, there's a double distillation process, little copper pot still attached to each of the columns. So I have six columns with six little pot stills attached. So it's a double distillation process there. Um, all copper though, very important in my opinion to have copper stills. After that, the whiskey's obviously clear, obviously clear as water, 140 proof will go through the charcoal mellowing process. Um, I don't know if you guys ever tasted like our before and after charcoal mellowing. Mm -hmm. I think we did. Y'all did a release of yeah. okay, that, mm -hmm. didn't you? We did at our gift shop. And I think we yeah. did get to taste it last time we were here. Good, good. So you know that after it goes through the charcoal, it doesn't taste like coal or char mm -hmm. or anything. Right. Right. Yeah. So if you taste anything that reminds you of charred wood, on the record, it comes from this thing, <laughs> not the charcoal. Um, the charcoal itself, you know, we are making it on site. We're burning that hard maple down into black charcoal. It is not charred wood. Right, there's no remaining wood there. It is completely combusted. It's just like if you use a water filter at home, you run your water through it, does it make it taste like coal? 
no. Or smoke, no. It doesn't add anything to the water, right? And that's what the process does for us. If you taste any of that, it's coming from the barrel itself, not the charcoal meddling process. That is a removal process. Our, our Tennessee whiskey is 80% corn. It's a lot of corn, right? Even in the bourbon world, it's kind of the high end of corn. And most, most grain bills are, you know, between 70 and 80, typically. Um, but when you open up a random bottle of Jack number seven or single barrel select, you don't smell or taste hardly any corn because of the charcoal malloy, right? And that is unusual. And now there's nothing wrong with that flavor. That's a very common bourbon whiskey character. That's okay, that's perfectly fine. But it's just not what we want in our product. That's not how our product was historically made. And so you get the sweet estery fruity notes. All of those kind of sweet floral fruity notes and top notes are in the whiskey when it's clear right off the still. But with so much corn, right, and that kind of heavy corn oil character that comes across in the new distillate, it covers it up. So about going through that charcoal, it takes about a day, it takes about 24 hours for the whiskey to go through 10 feet of charcoal. By removing that oiliness, then you start to really pick up on those soft, fruity, floral notes that will then go into the barrel and continue to do things and create more of those flavors as it sits in the barrel and ages. So, has y'all's yeast, yeast ever gotten away from you? Uh, I don't know about gotten away. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just heard some some stories that I don't know were accurate of like the yeast kind of getting loose and coming out of the warehouse or something. They had to clean it up or something like that. Uh, <laughs> this was way back in the day, though. Yeah. No I, comment. You know, as far as like <laughs> you know, yeast mashing and things. Yeah. If if um, if maybe timing is not where it needs to be, yeah, things can happen. Um, Why don't you make everybody uncomfortable? No, it's just, I mean, that's... <laughs> it's just a question. It's just a, it's a, <laughs> it, it, it can happen, especially when you're dealing with the small grains, um, you know, which you smash the small grains. Um, it's kind of like James. If you don't control him, he's going to get out the door. Could have happened. going to go crazy. Could have happened. The, and the malt whiskey, the 100% malt whiskey is, is very much, it foams a lot, and that, that can create some challenges as well uh, with things kind of acting up in a fermenter. Um, so yeah, think, look, things happen, right? But that's why we got great people here doing what we do. Are you uh, direct steam injected or jacketed? In the cookers? Yeah, well, steam. everything. Steam injected. There's steam no jacketing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Anything else? Yeah, Where do those steels come from? Vendome okay. in Louisville. Yep. There. We we have a design that's quite different than most. Um, you know, there's some. We run that doubler really more as a thumper. Um, there's not, there's no condenser in between, um, so it's that you know it's the vapor that's blowing off of the top of the column that will go in, feed into the doubler, really the thumper that will then heat the liquid that is that has been condensed and built up into that thumper, and then that that's then cooking off of the thumper, the doubler is what's going to be cooled back into our new made whiskey. So, do you have a dedicated rye still, or do you have to shut it down, clean it out before you shut it down, clean it out? Yeah. Yeah, we built an additional still house on the other side of the hill over here about six years ago. So we have two additional stills over there. We have four down here, two up there. Getting ready to add two more here, hopefully pretty soon. Charcoal melon was where I was at, I think. We talked about what it does in removing the grainy note. What it does not do is prevent us from labeling as bourbon whiskey. If we wanted to market our whiskey as bourbon, we would just change the label and put bourbon on it. Um, very easy. Right, um, so that's what it does. That's what it doesn't do. It doesn't bother me um, for Jack Daniels to be listed on a bourbon list anywhere because it is. All Tennessee whiskey is bourbon. Not all bourbon is Tennessee whiskey. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Can we take him above 150 and sterilize him? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Well, hell, he's 350. <laughs> what do you mean 150? <laughs> <laughs> Him while we're at it? No. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing after the mellowing process is the barrel, and I promise we're going to go get some whiskey and taste it here in just a second. Um, but the barrel itself, you know, we do have the advantage of having two cooperages in house and a stave mill as well out in Clifton, Tennessee. Um, wonderful things that we can do with innovation, but then also the consistency of making a barrel ourselves. Um, we do about a 13 minute toast, which is heating the inside of that, the, the barrel, which this stave. I'll knock over one of your glasses has been toasted you can see the caramelization the red layer you can actually see the depth over there it's almost an eighth of, eighth mm -hmm. of an inch deep mm -hmm. um, we can measure we get we get barrels from 
all over. I want to know what other girls are out there and what they look like and how they go. Um, we can literally measure that red layer, which is the color and the flavor. The char is no color and no flavor. The char is basically a carbon filter, just like charcoal melting. But the residual heat, if you only char a barrel, is what's going to then toast what's behind it. Mm -hmm. This is what you want to get into and pull those flavors out of. Um, so that 13 minute toast, we do put a lot of effort into, and then the char is about 20 to 25 seconds after that, um, which would give us a pretty aggressive char. If we, you know, if we were sourcing, you know, on the open market, you'd be between a three and a four typically on average um, that we can do in about 20 seconds, um, which is pretty remarkable. But if you stop and think about, well, that barrel is dang near a thousand degrees when we're toasting it for 13 minutes, it's almost combusting before it even gets to the char fire, right? So, um, you know, that's the way we make a barrel. We certainly believe it's the best for us. Are you yeah. toasting a char in the head, the top and bottom? Of yeah, the absolutely. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Well, the heads are not going to get toast. They only right. get charred. They only get charred. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, but they do get the char. Yeah. There's no way those. Um, so, the 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 barrels are first raised, right, in their own temporary bands. Then it will go, you know, basically on a conveyor, and they sit on what we call heat pots, um, and it's basically a wand that radiates that heat through, you know, the, you know, what is it, probably a foot or so, and then into the radiated heat into the sides of the barrel. It gets this color form, and you're pulling those wood sugars up, you're starting to degrade your hemicellulose and, you know, tannins and all that good stuff. Um, so that process, there's really no way to put a barrel head on the top of that, right? Okay. So it just gets the char. So char only on the heads, but the whole body, which is, 90% of your surface area anyway. Mm -hmm. so. I know James and I have done picks and they part of the marketing is that they toast the, the head and top and bottom of the barrels. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all did that here. No. Still not tastes about crap. <laughs> <laughs> not, not typically. Um, and then, I mean, there's there's things that we could do. Um, but why change what it broke? Right, right. And, you know, I think barrel making is something that with technology has really improved over the last 30, 40, 50 years, right? Um, you know, back in the day, who the heck knows how good of a char you got on anything, right? Mm -hmm. and of course, the char is the requirement. You know, we really started toasting not until about 2003 or four, somewhere in there, um, maybe, maybe a year or two before that. Um, but we used to, Brown Form used to be more heavily in the wine business than we are now. They had Coopers in had Mendocino, Coopers in California, and wine barrels are not charred, they're toasted. And so that's where, you know, the idea of how could we apply it. And we, we actually got a patent on our toasting process. So um, if you ever get to go visit our Coopers, you'll get to go and see all of it except going into the toasting room because of that patent. Mm -hmm. um, so they won't let you go in there. There's but, something proprietary. Yeah, but I just told you how it works. So. <laughs> <laughs>